Hey everyone, my name is Progeny Patha and I'm the chairperson of AXO, the Association of African Exhibition Organizers. Thank you so much for listening in to our Agile Leadership Series today. We've been doing these interviews for the past few months and we're so grateful for the great leadership within our industry. We attempt to learn, inspire and support our industry and we've been getting into the hearts and minds of the leaders within our industry to help you do just that and we're learning as we go along. So today I'm really thrilled to be joined by Carol Weaving, who's the Managing Director of Reed Exhibitions. Carol is one of the stalwarts of the exhibition industry. She's the founding chairperson of AXO. She's our go-to person, very well known for her engaging spirit, her boundless energy, industrious nature, and her great leadership, of course. So a very warm welcome to you, Carol. Thank you, Progeny. Great to be with you. Now, I think there's been so much happening and you've been working exceptionally hard along with the rest of us. We all teamed up and we've been together. Um, but whilst we're fighting this battle, there's just been a lot going, obviously, going on in the background, obviously, uh, at Reed Exhibitions. So what would you say your greatest challenge has been as Reed Exhibitions during this crisis? Yeah, I mean, I think it's like most sort of exhibition event organizers across the, the country, of course, and across the world, actually. It's the planning or, or the inability to plan properly. So I think whether you're running a trade show, a consumer show, it's, it's incredibly difficult because there's no real end in sight in terms of the pandemic. It's very difficult to arrange your dates. You know, when are you going to be running an event? Um, when are you able to run an event in terms of the Disaster Act? Um, and at the moment, as we know, it's probably going to get extended again to the 15th of December. And then, you know, what does that mean then for shows in the first and second quarter of next year? So I think it's definitely about planning. It's not really understanding, you know, when we're going to get back on stream, when we're allowed. And then also, of course, being able to run successful events where I think both exhibitors and visitors have full confidence in your event and in your project so that they will participate. So it really is that the, the fear of the unknown, of course, but of course there's always, there's always upsides and there's always opportunities. Exactly, and as the scenario has changed through the year, I mean, you know, when we first sat in March this year, it was, we were all making predictions about when we'd be able to open and eventually, you know, events got moved and moved and moved um, and calendars changed. And how have you been able to handle scenario planning in your organization? Yeah, I mean, this is definitely the most difficult thing. Again, because of certain events that maybe only happen once every two years, the biannual events, um, you know, there's so many factors you've got to take into consideration. So you have to do your sentiment surveys with your exhibitors, your visitors, your stakeholders, your sponsors, you know, what date works for them? What is the competitive landscape? What other events are happening during the, the dates that you're even looking to move into? So it's really, really difficult. But at the same time, you know, what we did was uh, when the announcement happened, we were actually in the middle of buildup of one of our shows. So we literally had to just break everything down, bring everybody back. I mean, my poor team were devastated. Um, but what we, we really did then, we made a decision and we said, we really don't think we're gonna get back on track for the whole of 2020. We don't think there's enough uh, lead time to convince exhibitors, especially with all of the unknown and the lockdowns and what have you. So we moved, we moved all of our events by, I think, May this year to 2021. Um, in fact, what we did, we just said, we're not running the 2020 edition, but we'll see you next year at the 21 event. Um, so I think in one way that at least alleviated the fact that you're trying to postpone or you don't know what you're doing for 2020. But obviously now the pandemic's still in play. We still have the disaster act in play. So now we're saying, okay, so what happens in 2021? Um, you know, we've got a couple of events in Q1 and Q2 that obviously we're now, we're looking at. Um, and we're engaging with our customers. And we really do these um, customer mindset barometer surveys. And they are fantastic because they really get under the skin of how your exhibitors are feeling, how your visitors are feeling. Do they want to need an event? Because ultimately what we cannot do is just run an event for the sake of running an event. You've got to, you've got to run an event because it's what your customer needs and wants. And you have to understand what they need and want. And so, you know, there's a lot of uh, research that you have to do, there's a lot of conversations. Um, and it's also quite difficult if you're skipping a whole year of events, how do you keep in contact with your customers? How do you keep connected? And that's equally as important. Well, everybody's going through their own, you know, their own drama, whether it's travel cuts, whether it's marketing budget cuts, whether it's um, restructuring of businesses, you know, a lot of people have had to restructure. Um, you know, a lot of retrenchments have happened, certainly in our industry. So it's really, you've got to navigate all of the above and it's, it, it becomes a challenge, yeah. 
definitely a big challenge, of course. But I know from seeing uh, all the activity that's been happening in, and in your offices, I think your teams have still been super busy. Um, so I'm sure they've astounded you in many ways. And, and what would you say has been uh, the most proud moment for you during these past six months, watching your team and them doing lots of, they've still been doing so many activations. Yeah, we really have. You know, it, when you go through something like this, it hits you personally and professionally. So your guys are already, you know, your staff's already feeling a bit like, oh, this is tough. You know, it could be their husband, wife, friends are, are being made redundant, whatever the case may be. And you know what? It really brings out the best in people, I believe. And it certainly has here. My guys have been amazing. Um, and, you know, as much as I'm sort of a born optimist and I'll just keep going regardless of what comes in my way, you know, it's quite hard to motivate people during a pandemic like this. But I have to be honest, you know, they, they've been absolutely amazing. And I think we've kept everybody really, really busy and they've enjoyed it. It's been a challenge. We've had a lot of virtual events this year. Um, and, it, and whether it's a consumer show or trade show, we've, we've done a real smorgasbord of, of different digital events and activities. So, for instance, with um, World Travel Market, we've, we've done eight masterclasses. Um, and we've done 18 webinars. And these are hard hitting masterclasses. It's from experts in the industry. What do you need to know? How is it affecting my business? What are we gonna do and how do we go forward? So not just sort of what I call the warm and fuzzy, but real hard hitting, real genuine business, great outcomes. We've had a lot of positive feedback. Um, and you know, it's, it's really about solving the problems in the industry, I guess. And I think on average, we've had about 2000 um, views on our masterclasses. Um, so that has been amazing. Um, and then for instance, for uh, Decorex, now Decorex has got a very strong trade component, but it's also got a consumer component. So we had a, a, a really fantastic trade component um, and it happened over a couple of days. We had over a thousand trades pre-qualified. So they weren't, you know, it wasn't sort of a hit and miss. Um, we had live chats so they could actually do matchmaking. They had business meetings with each other. We wrote over 10 million rands worth of business on this one particular platform with Decorex Trade. So that was phenomenal. And, and then on the consumer side, you've got the opportunities to shop and look at the trends. And I think just to network with, you know, like-minded people and, and just with designers and see what's happening in the industry. So, so you don't lose that momentum, that you keep that connection. And at the end of the day, some of these virtual events can really add significant value. Um, and I think it's, it's how you do it, of course. And then we have something like Comic-Con, and I think we've got 1.9 million impressions. We had 130,000 video views. Um, I, I mean, that was just phenomenal. And we had over 100 hours of content. We had international wow. celebrities all from their Zoom or their virtual lounge or whatever the case may be. So, yeah, we really kept really, really busy with all of our events. And just to keep that connection with our customers, really, really important. Yeah, and it keeps it allows your customers to see that you're still there, that you're still working hard to get them the business that you would normally have uh, within restricted circumstances. And I think that will um, hold you in high stead in the year ahead. I think that is really, really important. Like you said, it's all about building confidence. But in the same vein, we've been all trying to go virtual and go online and we all had our preconceptions about it. Now that you've done it, what what are the, the pitfalls of going virtual? You know, I think, I mean, first of all, you've got to do this properly. You've got to plan it properly. You've got to get the right supplier. You've got to, you really got to shop around for the right platform and to say, okay, is that going to offer what my customers need? So again, you've got to start with your research and your survey. You know, the one big challenge right now is until such time as all of these virtual events have really proven themselves, you're not going to get the same amount of, exhibitors or sponsors spending the same amount of money on a virtual event as they do on a live event. However, you know, if you, if you market it properly and if you manage it properly and you ensure that you're getting genuine business meetings, genuine business transactions, and you're getting the right content, you know, the opportunity to grow your audience, to grow your communities is actually phenomenal. And I think once, you know, I can see even in some of the sentiment surveys, people are still feeling a little bit more confident now in the virtual events. It's taken them a while and they will start investing, but it's all about getting the return. So for me, there's no point running an event and trying to be a one hit wonder. It's got to be sustainable. It's got to be complementary to what you're already doing. And it needs to be offering something different to your live event. Is that a 365 sort of touch point? Is it 
continuous sort of, I suppose, exposure in that particular industry sector or community. So for me, it's really got to be a little bit of both. And I think the word hybrid, we hear it all the time, is, is really the way to go, because that way you can keep in touch with the audiences. You can, I think, give benefit to your exhibitors and your sponsors and stakeholders in terms of return on investment and having a much more prolonged and a much larger reach when it comes to, you know, that particular industry sector. So, yeah, you've got to be careful, but you've got to, you've got to do it the right way. You've got to plan it properly. You've got to test before you can think about going live. Um, I've seen a lot of technical glitches that you have to be so careful because that can really sort of bite you. Um, and of course, in South Africa, you know, with our electricity and our power supply is a little bit, uh, you know, unstable sometimes. So it's all of those sort of things. Those are the practical issues. But at the end of the day, you can really derive a lot of benefit. But is it going to be as commercially viable as a live event? I'm afraid not right now. Is it a good supplementary, complementary element to your live event? Absolutely. So it shouldn't be underestimated, but at the same time, don't overestimate it. And I think make sure you're giving the right return to your audiences. And like you said, you know, um, initially you would think that this is a one hit wonder, but it shouldn't be a one hit wonder. And it's something that we're going to have to invest in um, as businesses. So do you think, or, or what should I say is, what role do you think that hybrid and digital formatted events will play down the line when face to face comes back into action? Well, I think even with face to face coming back into action. So let's assume we have our first event in April next year. Now, there's going to be a certain amount of companies or individuals, um, certainly international delegates or buyers, they can't come here for the event because they could have COVID restrictions in their point of um, departure. Um, they may have had a cost cutting exercise, as many people have. So they might not be, a, you know, their travel budget's been cut, they can't come down. So what we're going to do on every single event we run, we'll give an opportunity for those people that can't attend in person. They will be able to attend virtually, but at the same time, it will be during the live event, so they can still have one-on-one -on -one meetings. So our exhibitors will have a lounge at the show where they can then actually have a virtual meeting, as well as the the face-to-face -face meetings for the people that are obviously here. Um, and I think you know the one thing that I, I think people have got to be very careful of is is having too much of an expectation that your international audience are going to be attend be able to attend in person. I think the hybrid gives really good opportunity to do a bit of a combination so that your exhibitors and your visitors are not feeling that there's not enough activity on the show floor. So what you don't want is your exhibitors sitting there saying, well, I only got 50% of the, the turnout at the show. If you then offer the virtual meetings um, and virtual sort of opportunities, they can at least then you know, keep busy all day and feel like they're getting the right will not feel like they must get the right return on investment. And I think that's the beauty of a hybrid. You can do things that you weren't ordinarily able to do, but to ensure that you continue to give the right value. Yeah, lots to think about there, definitely. Now, I know that, I mean, with Reed exhibitions being part of Reed Global, globally, um, you obviously have access to lots of international events and international venues and uh, working with Reed Globally, uh, it must have a great bearing on your actions in terms of understanding the case studies that's going on overseas. What have you learned from these uh, case studies and venues and events that have been happening? Well, I think anywhere in the world in this environment, in this industry, everybody's accelerated the whole digital element. You know, I think we were doing it already. All it's done is we've sort of accelerated it, as I said, but it's also we've been able to add additional elements to it. And I think if you look at the Reed Global portfolio, they've been doing some, you know, phenomenal events. Um, and they've had some great successes with some of their international shows. And to be honest, whether it's Japan, China, Australia, Singapore, wherever it is, they've been running virtual events you know, pretty much right the way through this year. World Travel Market London is actually starting on Monday, um, but they've had a whole series of webinars um, and they've, they've had a huge amount of participation or sort of interest and pre-registration, if you like. Um, and, you know, that, that's, a, that's a great benefit because you don't want to wait another year for your travel show to take place. The industry needs it. Um, so I think, you know, from that perspective, there's MIPIM, which is our uh, branch in France. They had a phenomenal property event or virtual. So I think it depends on the industry sector. I think it depends on the country. It depends on where you are with the COVID pandemic. But I think, you know, I think all of us down here can learn. And, you know, we've constantly been copying with pride, seeing what they're doing overseas, you know, making sure that we sort of also come up with some really sort of cool initiatives ourselves, you know, like our live chat during the Decorex um, 
event and you know that sort of thing is it's it's exactly what you need to be doing you've just you know you've got to be a step ahead and i think you've just got to i keep saying this but you've got to keep adding value because that's what this is all about and something you and i've talked about lots i think from the start was you know we realized that building confidence with exhibitors and visitors is so important how do you think as an industry and with all the various stakeholders i mean we all work with visitors and, and exhibitors at some point whether you're an organizer or a supplier or a venue how do you think we can all build that confidence i think it's it's a number of things you know if you look at some of the global surveys that are coming out or even the ones that we've done internally there's a couple of i think issues that both exhibitors and visitors feel i think exhibitors probably a little bit more they're worried about the social distancing so what we've done is we, you know we've looked at every venue we've looked at every floor plan we've worked with event safety council rule of the one in three you know um and i think by doing that, you can also then show your exhibitors and show your industry sector, we are going to be safe. This is what we're doing. These are all our COVID plans. Um, so I think that sort of makes them feel a little bit safer because I think that's number one, right? Because everybody's still nervous to a certain extent, although we're learning to live with it. The second thing is, you know, are we going to get enough visitors? If we exhibit at your show, how do we really know you're going to get enough exhibitors? That is why our hybrid model talks to that. So we have X amount of people that will come to the show obviously um, live and then we're going to bring in others uh, virtually in terms of hosted buyers and whatever else we are developing so and i think by showing them the capacities from social distancing working out your capacities working out how many people we can then actually prove and show them that you're not going to have a drop in numbers in terms of what we're allowed into the hall because i think that's what they're worried about so we've done all of these scenarios we've done all of these capacity um, floor plan so that they go, oh, okay, I didn't realize you could get that many people over that period of time. I think what people think is you have X amount of people coming to a show. What they're not realizing, some people could stay all day, but some people are in and out for two hours. So it changes the, the, the sort of calculation. So we've looked at that. And I think that is probably one of the biggest concern for exhibitors is, are we getting the right quality? Quality is always number one. Are we getting the right quantity? And obviously, are, are we going to be safe? Um, and I think also from an exhibitor's point of view, is my money safe in your organization? Because at the moment, you know, cash is king, everybody's concerning uh, or concerned about, do I get a refund? How does this work? So I think, you know, I know each company has their own policies, but I think it's really important that you don't go for a short-term gain, that you're in it for the long haul. It's all about sustainability into the future. So for, for ours, you know, if we're having to move a show from early next year to later next year, we'll just roll it over, but otherwise, you know, would we be offering refunds if we have to move from 21 to 22, of course, and we would have to do that. Um, and it's really important that we, you know, look after our clients. From the visitors, they've got a very sort of similar but different. They're not as nervous about the social distancing as long as they know we have it in place. Their restrictions are going to be international travel. You know, are they allowed marketing budget uh, or their, their sort of budget cuts may sort of prohibit them from attending a show live. So again, because we have the virtual sort of element as well I think you know I think everybody's feeling relatively okay and you know what we really need to do is find a vaccine real quick because that's the end of that of course to a certain extent um, but in the event that we can't you know we've just got to plan properly and we've just got to make sure that we give the right return that we like I said we don't go for a quick fix there is no quick fix and the one thing I would caution some organizers is don't think you can change the, charge the same amount of money for a virtual event as you can a live event mm -hmm. um, that you know that doesn't work and i think you know until you're a tried and tested event it's quite hard to get that sort of buy-in at this stage yeah absolutely i think that is uh the misconception about, um, about all of that you know and yeah. and i think um we we mustn't assume that our exhibitors and visitors because there's a general rule about social distancing and there's a general rule out in public that they're aware of what we're going to be doing and that that is guaranteed that you as an organizer or venue will take those precautions i think we have to just be preemptive and talk about it more than ever to build that confidence as well um so we all have to work together i suppose on that yeah you really do and i think you've got to keep connecting <laughs> to industry you know we do advisory boards it's really important we've got to engage with them you can't make a unilateral decision to move a show or just say by the way i couldn't do it in 2020 i'm going to do it at this date You've got to engage your industry, you know, um, and you've got to have those advisory boards. And it's a decision you make together at the end of the day. But, you know, I think if you're doing the right things, 
you know, they will start building confidence. But yeah, as an industry, you know, we've just got to be responsible. And I think, you know, you're doing great work through AXO and obviously we both sit on the events council and we're lobbying really hard to, to increase the capacities. Because right now, obviously, up until the 15th of November, 250 people in our industry is, is, is really not very much. I also think it's a little bit gray. I think we need to, we need to clear up some of these issues because I think they just said 250 people per venue. What does that mean? Is that per 10,000 square meter hall? Is that per 1,000 square meter hall? So I think we need to be a little bit clearer. We've got to get a lot more clarity. We've got to work closely with government. And I think from our perspective, the economic impact on trade shows is huge. I remember when we did this, uh, the AXO research, albeit a few years ago, um, I mean, you know, with direct and the amount of deals that are concluded at a, a exhibition, and this was across our entire industry, it was somewhere near um, 54 billion. And I think the tourism impact was 24 billion. So it just goes to show how really, really important um, that, you know, these exhibitions, these trade shows are, uh, obviously the consumer events are a little bit di different because it's some of it's retail, some of it's obviously a combination possibly. Um, but it's really important and we need to, talk to the Department of Trade and Industry, and we really need to make to get them on board to prove to them that we can actually open our shows safely. And we really can. And I think, you know, we're all doing it. We've all done it. We've all got our long COVID plans and our diagrams and our floor plans and our scenarios. And, and you know what? It's really just getting government to sort of come along with us and say, yeah, OK, I get it. I understand. So we've got a bit of work to do, but I'm sure we'll get there. <laughs> I'm glad I can see that you're still so positive and still so motivated. So how do you manage to keep that balance through all of this? <laughs> you know, sometimes I really don't know, but if, I think a nice glass of South African wine is always helpful. But joking aside, you know, at the end of the day, you have to be. We've got to, we, you know, we're carrying on. Of course, we're going to carry on. I mean, life goes on. We have to go on. Our industry, it's, very, it's a very important industry sector, very underrated in terms of the economic impact. Um, and honestly, the amount of business it generates for the country. Um, so, and at the end of the day, I think the hardest thing right now is probably motivating your team, getting them fired up, keeping them really busy. Um, you know, I think we thought when all the shows were canceled, oh gosh, you know, it's going to be really quiet. That, that, that's ridiculous. I don't even know why anybody gave that a thought. Um, you know, we were, we were lucky in one way because we had communicable disease insurance, but obviously, you know, it takes a while to sort of filter through. It's a very long process. Um, but that in itself is quite a lot of work. But I think planning all our virtual events, getting all of our plans up and running for next year, you know, it's actually been quite exciting. It's been a challenge. You know, a lot of my guys are learning so much about the digital world and it's great. It's accelerated it. They've had the time to at least focus on those, uh, those digital projects. So, yeah, in that regard, it's really good. And we've just got to keep them motivated. Absolutely. And, and what's wonderful, I think, about this whole thing is that forcing our teams to accelerate their, 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 their growth in this digital space um, allows us a different avenue uh, to monetize next year. Uh, oh, you know, with these avenues were previously not looked at, and now uh, our clients are able to see their merit. So and I think, Yeah, cool. and I think you're absolutely right. And I mean, we've got a lot of youngsters who are you know, they're really the future of the whole digital space and they're fantastic and they come with this boundless energy and, you know, they, they're loving, I mean, they're just loving life. They don't leave their computer, but they love life. So, you know, it's, it's amazing and it's wonderful and, and they're really driving it forward. But of course you have to monetize it. And, you know, I mean, there's lots of numbers being thrown around, but, you know, some people are saying, okay, at least 10, 15, 20% of my revenue needs to be in the digital uh, sphere. So, you know, there's there's a lot of, uh, I think it depends on your own personal strategy of your particular company, but there's opportunities, of course, there are. And I think, like I said earlier, it's about getting everybody to understand the value. And the only way you're going to do that is to prove it and yeah. to, to make sure you're building the communities and making sure you're doing the right type of matchmaking, buyer, seller, um, you know, and that type of thing. And then, you know, you'll be able to get there. Yeah, absolutely. Well, in conclusion, I have to ask, I know this is like a, I don't know, so it's a weird question, but, and you've been through so much and you can give so much of advice, but what would be your parting words to our industry and other leaders within our industry? Um, I think, you know, embrace digital. You know, some people are still nervous of it. Um, and so, some industry sectors are saying, oh, I don't want to know. I want to wait for the, the live event. I think, you know, do your homework, do your research, engage with your customers you know it's a very honest and open and transparent um 
route that you have to go if you're really going to do the right things. Um, you've got to stay positive. You know, at the end of the day, there's always opportunities, always. Um, and you've just got to look for them, you know, over and above PPE, of course. But, you know, if you look at the, the budget speech, speech recently, I mean, the government spend in certain sectors, those are opportunities for our industry, specifically in the trade shows. You know, have a look at what's going on the continent. You know, this is a great time to attend some of the real good trade investment events that are happening either in Africa or South Africa. Really learn, take the time to understand what's happening, where the key areas of spending and certainly infrastructure development are going to be. So, you know, there's, there's a lot to learn. You don't stop learning. It doesn't matter how long you've been in this industry, even as long as I have, but uh, you don't stop learning. Yeah, absolutely right. I mean, now more than ever, you have the time and that's been the luxury of before you might have wanted to really go to a trade show overseas or in Africa and just didn't have the time or it was just not within the budget. And now it's made possible. So uh, agree, you could so optimize on those opportunities now. Yeah, and you know, you, you're absolutely right. I mean, our budget cuts mean we're probably not gonna do as much traveling as we have done, but at the same time, now you can still attend everything. And you know, that's, that's what's so fantastic. So even if you're just a browser, even if you just wanna go and have a look, you know, you wanna just go and look, see. And I think often that is the case. You wanna see what the trends are. You wanna see what, like, what new things are happening in our industry and, you know, how do you, aesthetically, how do you make it better? So, as well as, you know, the content side, but content, content, content is what it's all about. That is so true. Well, thank you so much, Carol, for your valuable insights. It's been a wonderful conversation. And uh, thank you for fighting the fight with us uh, all together. Uh, we know there's, there's an end to it. We do hope and we remain optimistic, <laughs> carrying your optimism through us. <laughs> we, we carry on, Progeny. You know, we're going to keep fighting until we really get where we need to go. So, And that's what you have to do, honestly. It's just one of those things, I guess. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much. You certainly Thanks. fulfill the role of agile leadership, I think. And to everybody that's been listening in, I'm sure you've thoroughly enjoyed this conversation. We've been waiting very long for Carol to hear those words. And I think being such a key player within the industry, I think uh, these words mean a lot to all of us. Uh, so thank you so much. We appreciate the industry support as well. And I'm sure you do as well. Um, yeah. So uh, to all of you that's watching, um, you can catch the rest of the Agile Leadership Series on our YouTube channel. Um, and we will continue to interview many more leaders in our industry and find interesting conversations and content that will inspire, support, and motivate you in your journey ahead. I'm Progeny Patha, Chairperson of AXA. Mm -hmm.